Members and ladies and gentlemen, this is the March meeting of your Transportation Advisory Committee. Good to see you all here today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are conducting this meeting today, obviously virtual. Uh, we are in doing this in order to protect our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. We'll talk a little more about this a little bit later on in the meeting. We've got some questions, please. I'd like to ask members about your opinions on for in terms of going back in person or being virtual, but we'll spend a little time on that in a little bit. Um, today, all members will be voting by roll call. Uh, when it comes time to to vote, Kelly will call your name, and if you'll vote in the affirmative or the negative, we'll have a record of that for the action items that we have to take today. Kelly, will you please go ahead and call our roll? Yes, sir. Ms. Adams? Here. Ms. Larson? Here. Mr. Reed Cross? Here. Uh, Mr. Combest? Here. I see Mr. Horn. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Susie Gordon? Here. Mr. Merriam? Here. Mr. Hutchins? Here. Mr. Shores? Here. Mr. Reed Morris? Here. Uh, Mr. Willie Clark? Here. Is there anybody that I may have missed? Benita Feeney. Yes, ma'am. What you doing? Thank you. I think that's it then, sir. You Very have good. Thank you. Well, we, we have established the quorum. We've called our roll. Uh, members, you have always, you've already received our ethics statement. Most of you all have, are aware that if you have a, have a conflict of interest, which means you gain, you might gain financially or any members of your immediate family might gain financially from any vote that you are taking today. Uh, you're obligated to notify us of, uh, your conflict of interest so that we can excuse you from discussion on that item. Any member, any member feel that they have a potential conflict of interest with the four items that we'll be taking action on today? <clears throat> Very good. If not, um, you all re also received a copy of the February 17th TAC meetings. Hopefully you've had a chance to review them and make any suggestions or changes that you needed to Kelly. Uh, if there are no other revisions, we'll move for a waiving of the reading and approval of the minutes. Uh, Mr. Chairman, we do have a uh, public comment. Yeah, you know, if it wasn't for you, Kelly, I would just skip over the really important things in life. But thank you. Those two items ran together. And of course, I don't have my good glasses on. But thank you for the reminder. Um, and I'm going to probably do do you a disjust injustice, sir, if I press if I mispronounce your name, Sal Shapia. It's Sal Schiappa. <laughs> OK, if I if I get close, please give me a medal. Um, Mr. Sh Sh would you pronounce it for me again one more time, sir? Schiappa. I'm sorry. Sal Schiappa. Schiappa. Very good. Yeah. Very good. Can, Thank can you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. We can now. You were breaking up on us just okay. a moment ago. Mr. Schiappa, okay. thank you very much. This is our public comment um, section of our meeting. Uh, members, Mr. Schiappa had, had, uh, had uh, submitted a lengthy uh, comment, a statement, and we have forwarded that on to each of you so that you would have it in advance of this meeting. Uh, I believe, Mr. Sheppey, you were aware of our, our constraints, three minutes, but we'll, we may have a little latitude since we haven't had a public speaker in a while, and we've got a lot of minutes racked up in, in, in reserve. So, sir, if you want to go ahead, please do. State your name and address. All right. Thank you so much for hearing me. Uh, my name is Sal Schiappa. I live at 2434 West Mountain Street, Turnersville, North Carolina. I have lived at this address for 27 years. I have a concern for my personal safety and the safety of my property. My property is located in a stretch of road that is in an S curve. Traffic has increased and worsened significantly over the last several years. Directly across from me is a large metal warehouse 
that is several hundred feet long. At points, the building is as close as 15 feet from the edge of the road. Additionally, there was a large water tower on the warehouse property. The base legs are as close as 20 feet from the edge of the road. The close proximity of the water tower to the road, as well as concrete barriers placed near the warehouse wall and bay door, forces tractor trailers out onto the road, blocking both lanes of traffic. Traffic from both directions cannot see backing trucks until they are right on top of them. I have to block one of my driveways to prevent tractor trailers from using my driveway to straighten up to back into the warehouse. The road traffic, the close proximity of the building and the water tower to the road all contribute to my fear for my safety and my property. Over the years, I have had numerous incidents of personal property damage. There have been incidents where the damage has exceeded $6,500. Regrettably, I have also had numerous incidents of significant property damage where the vehicle was somehow able to continue driving or where there was no record of the incident. I have had to absorb the cost of those repairs myself. In August of 2020, a tractor trailer stacked with crushed cars flipped over, dumping its load directly on my driveway. This incident black blocked through traffic on the road for nearly five hours. Cleanup entailed a large industrial dumpster to be placed on the road, while several bobcats debris and filled the dumpster. Another tractor trailer was needed so a crane could lift the crushed cars and load them again to be hauled away. In October of 2021, a tractor trailer hauling several 9,500 pound steel cylinders flipped over onto my driveway. The cylinders traveled like torpedoes across my property. In addition to this damage, the tractor trailer leaked oil onto the soil, requiring a hazmat team to clean up. The truck's diesel fuel had to be pumped out before they could right the vehicle. Since August of 20 since the August of 2020 incident, there have been two additional incidents causing lesser damage. That is four incidents of traffic damage in 17 months. A rough guess would be that I have suffered personal property damage every 18 months since I have lived here. There have been other dangerous accidents in front of my property. One incident involved two cars colliding head on into each other. One vehicle then left the road and crashed through the wall of the warehouse. First responders had to cut through the car to remove the driver who had both legs broken and was unable to get out. On another occasion, I came home to find a Mustang convertible flipped upside down with the roof crushed to the doors crashed into a large tree at one quarter of my property. <clears throat> These are some of the ugliest accidents that I have that have caused damage to my property. There have been many more incidents where the damage was not as great. There have been numerous incidents where the wrecks and damage did not affect my property, but rather caused damage to a neighbor's property or where the vehicle crashed into the warehouse wall. One incident of crashing into the warehouse happened within the last six months. There is also the danger of vehicles that pass on the double yellow line in the curb. When it happens, you just cannot believe what you are seeing. Tractor trailers attempting to back into the warehouse will stop in the middle of the road and leave their truck find out where they should be going. 
This annoys traffic in both directions because they cannot see through the curve to know why traffic has halted. I have video of trucks trying to back up taking two and three minutes to, renew, to maneuver. All of these issues contribute to a dangerous road and to the safety of all. I need your help. Please tell me how I can protect my property and safely traverse this short section of road. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stappa. <clears throat> we appreciate your comments, and um, I know uh, council members or uh, committee members uh, are, um, are very sensitive to the to the safety of our residents, no matter what municipality they happen to live in. Uh, unfortunately, the TAC doesn't have a great it doesn't have actually any authority for safety or road conditions. But what I'm going to do, if it's okay with you and the committee member or the, the uh, committee members, um, I'm going to ask our secretary to pass your com your concerns on to the Division Nine Department of Transportation. I believe this is a state maintained road um, for their attention. I'm also going to ask that we forward it on to the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. Um, I believe this this is also this road particularly particular road is also under their jurisdiction. So um, and I, um, so that will be the steps that we take. And, and thank you, sir. I appreciate you taking time to share your concerns with us today. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. Mr. Chairman, this is Bill Apple. And since I am representing uh, Kernersville on the TAC at this point, and uh, Mr. Skipper, I uh, am also Mayor Pro Tem of the Kernersville for your information. Uh, I've spoken in addition, I think the chairman is exactly right, exactly on the point as to the responsible. I do want to add additional action that we can offer as the town of Turner's. Uh, you are correct, Mr. Chairman, in that this is a state maintained highway as opposed to a town street. Uh, you are also correct that the Clark County Sheriff's Office, as opposed to the Turnersville Police Department would be the law enforcement entity. Um, and even though uh, Mr. Skeppel li lives uh, outside the jurisdiction of the town, uh, I can offer two things that we can ask. Uh, uh, I can take responsibility for making a second communication and I'll speak with Mr. Ivy, uh, who is a division nine engineer uh, been a, a lifelong friend of mine, uh, and I can also uh, ask our uh, police department to have communications with the Forsyth County Sheriff's Department for us, uh, some assistance for you in law enforcement. We, we recognize that your problems are problems that are very real. Uh, in fact, I spoke with Mayor Morgan this afternoon about that exact location. She also happened to drive up on, on a very sudden and, and unforeseen circumstance. Uh, the truck you're talking about that was blocking at least one lane of the road trying to figure out where he was backing into. So we're going we're gonna to take some action as well. Certainly not at all <laughs> trying to usurp or to undermine the action being taken by the TAC and by the chairman. But uh, we want to do that too. We, I don't want to. I don't want to provide uh, fingers pointed to various other entities uh, to indicate to you that the town of Kernersville is not concerned about what you're going through. So we will offer our help, Mr. Chairman, if that would be helpful to the committee. Mr. Apple, I think that's a that's a fabulous offer, and uh, as we say, jump in with both feet and have at it. Appreciate it. Exactly. Can, we'll can do I it. Make, and can, yes. Can I tell you one other thing? Um, I, I really appreciate hearing from the mayor or Mayor Pro Tem of Kernersville. Uh, I hope I'm, you know, lighting some fires or whatever. But just so you'll know, uh, I have reached out to uh, Division 9 Highway. Uh, I have reached out to uh, the Sheriff's Department and spoke with uh, Lieutenant Little. Uh, 
Lieutenant Little came out here and saw some of the damage, some of the recent damage. Uh, it was uh, Lieutenant Little who encouraged me to reach out to Dave Plyler, County Commissioner, and it was Dave Plyler who encouraged me to reach out to the City County uh, Manager, and it was the City County Manager who encouraged me to uh, contact uh, Kelly and this particular uh, committee, uh, the TAC. So um, I'll do whatever I can do. And uh, again, thank you so much for your time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Yes, sir. Members, our action item number two, again, is our consideration of minutes. May we have a motion, please, to, to accept those. Rick Cross, so moved. John Larson, second. Mr. Cross makes the motion. Mr. Larson makes the second. Any further discussion? Kelly, will you please call the roll? Yes, sir. Ms. Adams? Yes. Mr. Larson? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rick Cross made the motion. Um, Mr. Combest? Aye. Mr. Bill Apple? Aye. Mr. Horn? Mr. Yes, ma'am. Ms. Susie Gordon? Aye. Mr. Marion? Yes. Mr. Hutchins? Yes. Mr. Schwartz? Yes. yes. Ms. Henney? Yes, I raise a report. Ms. Finney? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rick Morris? Yes. Uh, and then Mr. Willie Clark? Yes. That concludes it. Very good. Thank you, members. That motion carries unanimously. Just, just one reminder, please, if you uh, happen not to be engaged in conversation with the committee at this point, would you mute yourself, please? Uh, we're getting uh, a number of feedback, I think, that's causing maybe some difficulty to hear. Uh, Byron, you have our second item on the uh, agenda today. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, members of the board. Uh, the 2020-2029 Metropolitan Transportation Improvement Program is a listing of all the projects programmed for the Winston-Salem urban area. This document is a subset of the 2045 Metropolitan Transportation Plan and reflects projects programming including the state's transportation improvement program. The NCDOT regularly updates the STIP to include new projects and modify existing ones. This can be done for reasons such as funding, municipal requests, or schedule changes. Statewide projects are projects which are located in our planning area as their schedules, funding, and programming is modified. These changes are also reflected in our M2. Including in your materials or project modifications, additions, and deletions, including statewide additions for various traffic, traffic separation study and closure programs, administration at the request of the rail division, operating and capital assistance amendments at the request of the park. These amendments were made available for public review from February 5th, 2022 through March 9th, 2022 per our public participation policy. No comments were received during that time. I'll be happy to answer any questions about this item. Thank you, Byron. Members, any questions for Byron? Mr. Press Chair, I have a question. Yes, ma'am. In light of uh, why my visit in Washington along with other members of the city council for Winston and staff, one of the things that we know is happening is the increased cost of construction. And we met with some of the staff from DOT as well as uh, the governor's, Cooper's, the governor's office in Washington. And I'm wondering, Mr. Chair, uh, Will the rising cost of construction affect anything that we're voting on presently? And if it does, what is our, our option or next steps after that? Will it have to come back for an amendment or what? Ms. Adams, that's a great question. It's probably one that Mr. Ivey could answer, is in a better position to answer, or um, I don't know. I, I, I could give us some input on that, Mr. Horn. I was going to say, Mr. Clark, yes, sir. Oh, it's Mr. not Perkins. Clark, it's Perkins. It's Perkins, yes, sir. Uh, 
Councilwoman, uh, right now we're reviewing the STIP in terms of getting it ready for the next uh, presentation for 2010 through 2029. And right now we're evaluating the what the effects of escalation are. Uh, we've put in an escalation clause of about 2% uh, for overall, overall for the projects. We're also looking at a contingency number that we can be able to have in case projects may go over after we uh, complete the step and you review that. And the priority is that for Winston-Salem and any other uh, division within, within the Department of Transportation. Uh, we've set the escalation cost. We now have updated costs. We reviewed all the projects and we're now putting them in categories of priority for that can be done. Those who that may be in a good position if something falls out and it becomes to put that project going forward. But we're going to release that to all of the MPOs and of course the city councils so they can review those projects and understand where they fall in terms of priority and the funding as well as any grants that you have perhaps gotten from other sources to be able to support that project. That's an ongoing process that's been going on now for almost a year and a half, and we look at it every month, uh, and we look to look at uh, a final listing probably at our April or May board meeting so that we can understand just where we are in terms of the number of projects that will be in the next step and what the cost will be for them and what uh, contingency money We'll put in there to be able to take care of those increasing costs after we go into construction. Mr. Chair, one more question I'd like Mr. Perkins to ask him, please. Yes, Mr. Perkins, do you think it will come down? There's two questions. Do you think it could happen like we had a few years ago uh, when we kind of hit the floor and there wasn't any money uh, to finish some projects or start them? Uh, do you think that could happen? And do you think that the infrastructure money could or might be used to complete or start a new project? Right, I heard the second part of your question. We, uh, we are now evaluating what the new bill will have an impact in terms of what additional funding that may be able to have on us. So we are reviewing that right now because of course we just saw it uh, and we're looking at the implications of that. Uh, so I don't can't tell you specifically. What was the first part of your question? I didn't hear the first part. The first part was if you remember a few years ago uh, when the recession and uh, the money uh, kind of went away, uh, it got pulled down and, and we got to a point where there were some oh, yeah. projects that yeah. couldn't be completed yeah. or started. Yeah. Do you think that could happen? In light of again the growing uh, cost, I don't think we're going to get to that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we we, we kind of have a. I'm I'm sorry, I got a bit of that too, but I think the real answer is that we don't anticipate going into a floor where we cannot provide funding for the projects we have in the stip. The real issue for us now is to control our costs and be able to project what we think is reality based upon inflation and other factors, deliveries, material costs, uh, labor costs, all that stuff that we've thrown in this mix to figure out how we best can present back to the citizens of North Carolina. This is what we think we can construct over the next 10 years. So that's Thank where we are. And we we we're very vigorous. Every single day. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Perkins. You uh, you've earned your pay for the day. Thank you very much. Any other questions? Thank you so much. I apologize for being late too. By the way, it's not a problem. Is there any uh, any other questions? Any other comments? All righty. Again, we'll uh, entertain a motion and second. Miss Adams, I move for approval. Ms. Cross, I'll second. Ms. Adams makes the motion for approval. Mr. Cross makes the second. Any further discussion? Mr. Perkins, I, I did notice one of the projects that seemed like uh, had had was very almost clandestine. It was federal monies for federal bridges for federal lands and without anything. Are we are we are we kind of putting together a uh, an area five here in in North Carolina someplace that uh, 
Uh, I th it was very cryptic. Oh, because they were trying, trying to I think, real issue. I think we were trying to interpret the language that was came out in the budget and the program just to make sure we put it in the right bucket of money to be able to spend it yeah. and not go to jail for it. That's exactly right. Very good. We have a motion and a second. Any additional discussion? Kelly, if you call the roll, please. Yes, sir. Ms. Adams? Yes. Okay. For the record, this is Ella Main, President. Yes, sir. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Ella Main? Yes. Mr. Rick Crosswood? Yes. Mr. Combest? Aye. Mr. Apple? Yes. Mr. Horn? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Marion? Yes. Mr. Hutchins? Yes. Mr. Shores? Yes. Ms. Finney? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ruth Morris? Yes. Mr. Perkins? And uh, Mr. Willie Clark. Mr. Willie Clark? Yes. Yes. That concludes it. Thank you, members. That's passed unanimously. Byron, you have our Unified Planning of Work program as our next action item, please. Okay. Um, Again, good afternoon, everyone. The, all metropolitan planning organizations or MPOs that are designated as transportation management areas or areas that are, or urbanized areas with populations greater than 200,000 according to the US Census must develop an annual unified work program or UPWP in coordination with both the federal highway and the federal transit administrations. The UPWP identifies what transportation and transit planning projects and work tests will be completed during the fiscal year and the estimated amount of local, state, and federal funding associated with each task. Including your packets are the funding sources and narrative tables, FTA allocations, and five-year planning calendar for the NPO. Also included are planning studies that will be funded under the DA funding based on our federally funded project methodology. I'll be happy to answer any questions about the UPWP. Members, any question for Byron? If not, we'll entertain a motion for approval, please. I move for approval, Mr. Chair. Alamein second. Ms. Adams makes the motion. Mr. Alamein makes the second. Any further discussions? Mr. Chair, I'd like staff to know that, you know, whether they believe it or not, we read this stuff that they put together, <laughs> yes, we do. these reports. And I have to tell you, this one for the, for the month meeting was the most interesting one to me. Thank you very much for making it very clear to understand. Mr. Mr. Chairman, John Larson. Yes, sir. Could somebody explain to me, I noticed throughout the documents of references to Union Station, uh, working with uh, assisting Winston-Salem on Union Station Center planning and what have you. I'm also curious about the references to rail and transit integration planning, that, that, part, of the, that part of the work plan. Could we tell somebody give me a quick update on where we are in Union Station as far as rail service to Winston-Salem? Byron, do you want to take that on or you want to tap someone else? I was about to tap Kelly. She already got me. Very good. Yes, sir. I could try to explain to, to, to answer your question. This refers to any uh, kind of coordination. We're still trying. We're still working and asking uh, different uh, community members, different partners, Different partner agency, NCDOT, and and, and um, FHWA, and, and the rail uh, agencies to eventually bring back uh, passenger rail to Winston Salem. So any kind of uh, coordination um, that we do that has to do between rail and uh, and transit um, that falls under that category. Another uh, project that would fall under transit and rail um, would be our uh, TOD grant. 
which is our transit oriented development grant. Uh, it's funding that we had received several years back that we're currently working on uh, for a, a grant to uh, determine um, how we can develop a, a certain corridor to eventually uh, have some sort of uh, uh, streetcar. Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Uh, I think for the past 10 years, every time I go to DC, they probably get tired of the choo-choo lady for Winston. Um, I talked about it this past week with uh, the NDOT, HUD, the governor's office up there, everybody. And again, I have to, and, and I got to give it to them. We're talking about it. The mayor is going to pull some folks together to get us all in the room uh, because I stress to them the importance that if Western North Carolina, which the Piedmont, this MPO is the West. And if we are still continue to be bypassed because they're looking at rail, uh, either from Asheville or somewhere down to Charlotte, that again, we will be bypassed because that rail into Charlotte will go to Greensboro and all points East and Southeast. And that, you know, that they wanted to tell me what the situation was about Norfolk Southern, that they opt and would rather move, uh, what is it, materials and thick freight versus passengers. But uh, I can tell the other council members and elected officials and mayors on this call and staff that we will be pulling everybody together to understand if we don't have rail to this part of the state, we will be left out of a lot of economic development and other things coming down the pike in the future. Young people and people depend on transportation and rail is one of them. And the fact that we used to have a rail out of here passenger and everybody around us has it, uh, we're gonna pull together the Congressman. I spoke with Senator Tillis Senator Burr, I spoke with uh, Kathy, Representative Manning, but we're looking to, to do a joint effort of all of the, the congressmen of the districts in this area of North Carolina and our other uh, state representatives as well, mayors, council members, and others, uh, so we can all get together and get a clear picture of what will happen to the West and the Piedmont if we don't have rail, and I'm gonna end on that. Thank you, Ms. Adams. I'm, in fact, you recall probably 15 years ago, uh, I was part of a delegation uh, that included, gosh, it included a whole group of folks that went down and spoke with Governor Hunt. And we made what I thought was a very persuasive presentation and showed where at minimum a spur should come, with, come through Winston-Salem. And we, got, we, we were, it was very well received at that time, but obviously, that request has languished a bit. So thank you very much for picking this up. You're absolutely correct. This is essential, essential not only to Winston-Salem, but also to all of the uh, all of the, all the municipalities involved in our MPO. But thank you for your efforts there. Very good. Do we have, um, let's see, we have a motion and we have a second. Do we have any additional discussion? If not, Kelly, if you call the roll, please. Yes, sir. <laughs> Mr. Adams? Yes. Mr. Larson? Yes. Mr. Elamine? Yes. Mr. Cross? Yes. Uh, Mr. Combest? Aye. Mr. Mike Horn? Yes, ma'am. Ms. Gordon? Yes. Mr. Marion? Yes. Mr. Hutchins? Yes. Mr. Shores? Yes. Mr. Morris? Yes. Mr. Perkins? Yes. Yes. And Mr. Willie Clark? Yes. That concludes it. Thank you, members. That is unanimous. Uh, Matthew, you have our first item for, for consideration for future uh, action next meeting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon, TAC members. Uh, so this item is a review of the surface transportation block grant direct attributable and transportation alternatives direct attributable funding uh, for the recommended projects through the 2022 call for projects. Um, so as a, a transportation management area, the Winston-Salem Urban yes. Area MPO has the authority to program available DA 
um, surface transportation block grant direct attributable and transportation alternatives program direct attributable funds for transportation planning, bicycle, greenway, sidewalk, street and highway, transit, and other projects in the urban area. Um, on January 4th of this year, we announced a call for projects to begin the process of programming about $17 million worth of uh, federal transportation funds for those purposes. Um, over the course of the next month, we received applications uh, from MPO communities and agencies, and by the beginning of February, uh, we had received 11 sidewalk projects, three greenway projects, two intersection projects, one small roadway project, and one transit project for funding consideration. Uh, the total amount of federal funds requested through those uh, 18 projects was approximately $28 million. Um, the projects uh, were reviewed by a, a selection committee, so we pulled together a group of uh, transportation planners and, and engineers and, and other representatives from the MPO, including uh, Kelly, myself, um, City of Winston-Salem engineering staff, Town of Walkertown staff, uh, and CDOT Division 9 staff, and a member of the public, um, and, and reviewed the projects, uh, evaluated them, um, and had discussion about them. And that committee agreed on a recommendation to fund 11 projects across five different agencies and organizations. Um, and the, the pages following this item You'll, you'll find the tables um, detailing the recommended projects for funding. Um, there's also a, a listing of, of maps for each of the projects. Um, so if you'd like, I'd be happy to take a, a couple minutes here and go through those tables of the recommended projects. A um, couple things to note before we do that though. Uh, eight of the 18 projects were actually um, existing projects that had been funded previously for which there were additional funds needed. Um, and the other thing to note is that the, the goal of the selection committee and, and the MPO traditionally has been to, to fund the top rated projects. You know, we have a, an evaluation process that we go through and we want to fund those, those top rated projects, but we also strive for um, an equitable distribution across MPO communities. Um, so with that in mind, um, if, if we look at the bicycle and pedestrian recommendations here, you'll, you'll see that the top four projects were recommended for funding. Um, if we go to the next section, the Greenway section, um, there were three projects that were submitted and the, the committee recommended funding all three of those projects. Uh, the next section, there's the small roadway projects. Um, and there was only one of those submitted. It was the West Mountain Street project in Kernersville and, and the committee recommended funding that one as well. The next section is the, the intersection projects. Uh, there were two of those, the Louisville Vianna Road um, and Robin Hood Road Roundabout in Louisville, and the NC, NC 109 project in Wahlberg. Um, and both of those projects were recommended for funding as well, but you can note that uh, the, the Wahlberg project uh, basically uh, reached our limit on, on available federal funds. So uh, we couldn't, could not fund that project entirely. Um, and you'll see that there's about a $700,000 um, shortfall um, in, in the request compared to the amount that was available. Um, and if you go to the next, the last section here, this was the, the transit uh, category, and uh, we recommended funding uh, bus replacement for the Winston-Salem Transit Authority. Um, and the additional materials here, you'll, you'll see the uh, information about the call for projects, uh, the, the funding that was dedicated to each of the, the different categories, and as I mentioned earlier, the, the maps for each of the projects. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Matthew. Members, any questions for Matthew? If not, one came a motion. Oh. Uh, sir, this was an information item for. for this well, of course, well, of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> I just like the exercise so much that I enjoy hearing the roll call. So uh, I'll pass that one up. Mikey on automatic pilot, that's what it is. You know, I got to tell you, there's something going on today with, uh, I've got so many antihistamines in my body from all this pollen that's in the air. I'm surprised I'm not floating six feet off the floor. But thank you. <laughs> we've, got, we've got an able-bodied staff to keep me on track, and I sure do appreciate there that. You Matthew, go. you've, got our, you've got our second item on the, the uh, Clean Cities Coalition, please. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, 
So uh, I'm going to introduce this item, but we have uh, Ulrich Lunsford from the Clean Energy Technology Center. He'll do a, a brief presentation for you all on, on this effort and uh, their request of our MPO. Uh, but just by way of introduction, uh, the, the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center um, has a mission to advance a sustainable energy economy by educating, demonstrating, and providing support for clean energy technologies, practices, and policies. Uh, the, the Clean Energy Technology Center currently collaborates with three clean cities coalitions in the state. And those three coalitions cover uh, the Charlotte, Raleigh, Durham, and Asheville metropolitan areas. Um, and, and these coalitions were originally created by the US Department of Energy to help reduce reliance on petroleum products and improve air quality. Um, those three uh, clean city coalitions, however, only cover 44% 44, 44 of the state's population. Um, so the, the goal of the, the Clean Energy Technology Center is to create a fourth clean city coalition, um, and that would cover uh, additional 45% of the state's population, including um, our area. Um, the, the Clean Energy Technology Center has asked that our MPO support the formation of this new coalition um, to expand opportunities uh, for clean fleets, alternative fuels, and sustainable transportation. Uh, there's no financial commitment required of our MPO, um, but we would, in, in re return for our support, have access to resources um, that, that would be available to all of our member jurisdictions. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Mr. Lundford and um, have him fill you in on some of the details. Thank you, Elric. Okay. Thank you for the introduction, Matthew, uh, and good afternoon, TAC staff. And I want to thank you all for giving me the opportunity to present. I'm going to kind of briefly uh, breeze through these slides. This first slide just kind of like gives you an overview of the transportation technologies that the Clean Transportation Program provides. And you can go on to the next slide. So with those, uh, we're pretty much fuel neutral, and we do the education and outreach on those topics in the form of technical assistance uh, with education and outreach initiatives at workshops, meetings, um, and conferences, as well as through the administration of certain technology grants. Next slide, please. This slide is just a table of the overview with the services that we provide, and uh, it, it goes into the public and private, as well as state and local government agencies uh, that we provide those services for. And then the last part of that table talks about the benefits, which is ultimately the cost savings with the vehicles and helping out with the improvement of air quality within the environment. Next slide. So one of those administration grants that we provide and the primary administration grant that we provide is the Clean Fuels Advanced Technology Grant. And so that Clean Fuels Advanced Technology Grant uh, is for um, eligible counties. The slide says 24, but it's actually 23 that's um, in currently in maintenance status and uh, deemed in maintenance status by Federal Highways Administration as well as uh, the other CPAC guidelines. Um, but, and you can go on to the next slide. The, the RFP for this grant will be available in April, uh, but the, the grant, we have had a pretty successful track record over uh, the last 15 years, going all the way back to about 2006. We've uh, we funded close to $12 million in projects, and uh, you can see a list of those projects. So it's so I've been pretty successful. Um, next slide. And so the biggest event that we actually do is the Sustainable Fleet Technology Conference, which is going to be held in Durham at the Durham Convention Center. The last couple of years, it has been virtual and it's been a webinar series, uh, close to about 50 webinars that the program director has done uh, due to the pandemic. But we are pleased to announce that this will be returned in person and uh, you can get more details at sustainablefleetexpo.com. And you can uh, advance the next slide, please. And so um, another form of the education and outreach that we actually do is we have vehicle displays and demonstrations for the general public so that they can realize the benefits and cost savings and just the, the actuality of uh, it being fun to drive alternative fuel vehicles as well as electric vehicles. Uh, but we also have um, ride and drive events that are specialized for fleet managers, elected officials, and state and local government and uh, one that we will have 
in this like uh will be at the um the North Carolina Highway facility <clears throat> Highway facility in Gardner on March the 29th. And uh you all are more than welcome to attend that. Uh I will put the link for that in the, the chat after my presentation. Uh but it's going to have uh classroom instructions on hand talking about alternative fuel and sustainable uh fleet management as well as have uh, vehicles for display and test drives. Uh, so you're, you're going to be in for a treat. Uh, another event that we are, are doing is we're partnering with PTRC uh, to actually exhibit and display at the Piedmont Environmental Earth Day uh, Alliance. Well, the Piedmont Environmental Earth Day Alliance is having an Earth Day Fair, uh, which I'm sure you all are familiar with. And that is going to be the day after Earth Day this year. Uh, you can see the link up on the screen. You're more than welcome to stop by and say hi. We'd be glad to answer any questions. Um, and we also have an art contest that uh, is in the same vein of uh, giving students the chance to express their cre their creativity. Uh, K through 12 students can submit art uh, work that is uh, can display art. That's uh, that's pretty much uh, the contest is open now, and uh, it goes through the end of April. Um, next slide. So uh, the center is also partnering with the Division of Air Quality uh, within um, DEQ to bring the Volkswagen information sessions. Currently, all four uh, Volkswagen applications are currently out, uh, being the transit and shuttle bus, the uh, school bus replacement program, which is the latest one they put out, the level two for state uh, for state agencies and as well as the DC fast charging along priority corridors. And so as a courtesy to anyone who uh, becomes a stakeholder in the coalition, the center can actually be able to provide you all with pointers on how to uh, apply for the these either of these four grants. Uh, so we can actually review your application before it is submitted and, uh, and let you know if it's eligible and competitive. Uh, but there is one that's coming up in Kernersville um, next week, the 24th, at the Firehouse Station. We uh, definitely encourage you all to apply, and uh, I can put that link for um, that in the chat as well. And uh, I meant register, but yeah, we encourage you to register, we encourage you to attend, and we also encourage you to apply for the grants. Uh, next slide, please. And so... Uh, Matthew did a, a good job of uh, talking about the main crux of the coalition. So primarily the coalition, uh, it will serve or while we are applying to actually become that fourth coalition to help out with rural and underserved communities. And, and I believe that uh, Ms. Adams probably hit the nail on the head uh, when she was talking about some of the, uh, the rail. And so it, an example of uh, like a rail item that we could do is uh, with public-private partnerships. Uh, so we have connections with uh, other clean cities uh, as, as well as uh, former clean cities chapter representatives uh, that actually have interest in actually partnering with uh, other organizations to come up with, with our real locomotives. So I think that uh, that, that would be something that would benefit you all's area. Uh, and we, we do our, our technical assistance expertise, uh, and we also have grants that, that we actually put out to, um, to where um, all 100 eligible counties are uh, eligible to apply for the electric charging stations. Uh, but in the sake, or for the sake of this coalition, uh, as Matthew mentioned, uh, this will really give us a chance to be able to enhance the trainings and the conferences and, and just the um, overall activities on educational activities, uh, coordination in your region along the lines of sustainable fleet management and alternative fuel vehicles and advanced transportation technologies. And so uh, if you were not affiliated with a clean cities chapter, or if you were not a clean cities chapter yourself, you wouldn't, uh, you, you wouldn't probably know about these US DOE funds and you wouldn't be able to apply if you don't know about them. Uh, and so we're, we're, we're really here uh, to lean those services or offer those services. And uh, next slide, please. And so this is just a list of the agencies that can join. I won't bore, uh, bore you with all the different agencies, um, but 
you can see it's, it's pretty long, but it's uh it's not extensive it's, and it's not uh or it's not exhaustive of everybody that we can work with. Uh, but it's it's uh it's pretty large. Okay, next slide, please. And so for you all to actually join in the coalition uh, is essentially a three-step process. Whoever the contact person is for organization, uh, or we should say uh, the first thing is to do a board vote uh, to uh, however your, your organization does that to approve that uh, is the first step. And after that board vote to approve, um, then it's a matter of the contact person for that organization filling out a form that uh, goes into a, a few more questions uh, talking about the quarterly stakeholder meetings that Matthew mentioned, as well as the commitment, as well as the specific trainings that you all would like to see in your region. And that's about the extent of the form. And uh, we will use this as uh, a live rollout to go to DOE as well as other federal agencies uh, to, to say, look, these are all the stakeholders and recipients that uh, realize the need for these specific trainings and topics in their area. Uh, so that we can go ahead and uh, progress along in the, the other phases of, of applying for the, um, the coalition because it's a two year process. And I think we've lost Mr. Lunford. <laughs> Give him a second here. Matthew, I'm guessing that um, there is a link to this. Should we want to bring this back to our municipalities? For consideration? That's correct. Yeah. And, oh, I think he's back, actually. Oh, or can you hear us? OK, I can, Matthew. So we were just wrapping up the item. Was there anything yes. else? Yes. Okay. Mm, that's all. all right. Very good. Yeah. If, if you would, uh, if you would forward that out, I think, I think certainly we would be interested in learning more as a community and probably partnering with some of our other smaller municipalities uh, and seeing how we can make an impact um, in our part of the world. So if you'll forward us, figure out a way of force. For that information to those on this committee and certainly maybe some of the other municipalities, that would be really helpful. Great, thank you. And we'll have this um, to talk about at our next meeting. Thank you. Any questions for Mr. Lunford before we move on? All righty. Are we going to have a reappearance of the infamous Frederick Haith for our next item, or is, is, uh, is Byron going to handle it? I'll make the introduction. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, again. Um, this is a review of the North Carolina Department of Complete Street, the North Carolina Department of Transportation's Complete Streets Implementation Guidance. Um, although this item is listed and included for future action, there is no future action requested for this item. This is just an informational item. NCDOT Complete Streets Policies encourages planners, project managers, engineers, and designers to consider multimodal facilities and improvements for all appropriate transportation projects. Frederick, transportation engineer with NC Division, NCDOT's Division Nine Office is here to present more information on the complete streets materials found in your booklets. Um, with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Fred. Do we have you? Can you hear me now? Yes. We can. Thank you. The Complete Streets policy requires NCDOT to consider and incorporate different modes of transportation, such as walking, biking, and public transit when building or improving roads. The information I'm going to present today is an update to pre-existing guidance. The Complete Streets policy is not changing. The department is only updating the guidance. Next slide, please.
topics covered today, um, Complete Street's goals, the evolution of the policy in North Carolina, implementation challenges, a summary of the new guidance, and next steps and resources. For those unfamiliar with Complete Streets, the primary goals include first, to reduce pedestrian crashes and unsafe conditions, second, to improve access and mobility for those without a vehicle, third, to enhance quality of life by providing transportation choices such as transit, walking, and bicycling, and fourth, to ensure NCDOT has an equitable transportation system that works for everyone. Across the U.S., municipalities, counties, and states have developed and adopted Complete Streets policies. The graphic on the right illustrates the expansion of these policies across the nation from 2000 to 2020. I'll just take a second to let this animation play out. Fred, you're sure this is not a COVID map? Uh, <laughs> no, sir. Sir, I'm, I'm fairly confident that it's a uh, complete streets map. Great. Next slide, please. When looking at the history of complete streets, it, it does go back a few decades. North Carolina first established a bicycle program in 1974, the first state to do so, by the way. In 2009, the NCDLT board adopted the first iteration of the Complete Streets policy, and the most recent update to the guidance was released in February, which, help, which helps inform the 2019 policy. Next slide, please. These challenges led to a coordinated effort to update NCDOT's Complete Streets implementation guidance to streamline and improve implementation of the policy. Key challenges, inconsistent implementation across divisions, lack of standards, policy gaps, limited metrics, and a need for enhanced training. At the heart of the changes we are proposing is a new methodology to evaluate projects for multimodal needs, choose the right facility type to address those needs, determine impacts, and make a final decision about what to add, if anything, to the project being evaluated. The goals of the new evaluation methodology is to standardize streamline and guide project managers through a process of identifying needs, selecting the appropriate facility type, and estimating added impacts to the project. Next slide, please. Here is our five-step evaluation methodology process flowchart. In terms of guidance, we start on the upper left, and we have initial screening and data input. Then we move to transportation need determination, moving then to facility selection, followed with impact assessment. It's here that we take a little turn and circle back when we're reducing overall project impacts to assess with the project team ways to reduce overall project impacts and address any design or facility alternatives to address project constraints. Then we go to final analysis before moving through the rest of the project delivery network process in a project's development. Next slide, please. Step one is the initial screening and data input. 
which occurs in PDN Stage 1, Project Delivery Network Stage 1. The primary document screened is the CTP, the Comprehensive Transportation Plan. We also screen the Metropolitan Transportation Plan if one applies to the area. The other documents screened are municipal and region-wide plans such as bicycle and pedestrian plans. Next slide, please. To the right, the Integrated Mobility Division, IMD, demand estimation map is shown, which pulls data from the U.S. Census and American Community Survey data from 2015 through 2019 estimates. It's GIS-based, and I will take a moment to let the animation run through. Thank you. Step three is a risk assessment and facility type selection. This step includes applying the data collected in steps one and two to help the project team select the preferred and alternative facility types. Step four is an impact assessment and includes an assessment of project costs for right-of-way, utilities, design, and construction to determine where impacts can be decreased. All project modifications and design adjustments will be coordinated with the locality to assess for all available opportunities to manage cost. Schedule impacts will also be assessed in step five this has particular importance for projects like bond projects that have strict spending deadlines. This will be done on a case-by-case -case basis to determine the best path forward, forward with the project stakeholders. Step five also includes the final documentation of the decision-making in project development to ensure complete streets compliance. Next slide, please. There are several key dis uh, discussion points and issues that we were unable to address in the first edition of the methodology in project development. And some of these key issues are dependent on updates and innovations in other areas of transportation development, such as planning and maintenance. To address these ongoing topics, the department has formed three work groups to refine cost estimation and maintenance issues. Next slide, please. The department will continue to collect data, monitor implementation, and identify improvements to guidance for planning, prioritization, project development, and maintenance activities. Once again, the complete streets policy is not changing. The department is only updating the guidance. Um, the department has also um, conducted seven training sessions, uh, five of which can be found on the complete streets webpage uh, recordings, that is, also there, included in your packet, are supporting documents um, that go into great detail about the information that I've covered. This process is new, it's evolving, and we will continue to make refinements as we gather more data and feedback. So I highly encourage you, if you have questions or concerns, send them to the IMD uh, email address. And please, include Division 9. We're partners in this moving forward. Thank you. Any questions?
I think our chairman is muted. Yeah, you can I'm not sure if that's the Sudafed or if it's the um, Allegra or uh, which combination of, of items it is, but there's certainly something going on here. Uh, Frederick, always good to see you. Thank you very much for that information. Always appreciate your contributions to our meeting. Uh, members, we're part of our meeting where we have an opportunity to review staff reports. Um, of course, these were in your packet, so you had a chance to, to glance through them. Um, do any members have any particular request for any of these projects to be further explained? Mr. Ivy, I see your project jumping up on, uh, on the screen, I believe, or your report. Frederick, did you just put up, put that, or, uh, Byron, did you just put that up there as a point of interest? This is the first uh, staff report, and so I turn to the first one. Yeah. Okay. This is Division Nine, right? Yeah. Correct. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Chair, I, Pat, yes, I have nothing else to add unless there are any questions. There's Very a good. man. There's a man. He can answer to anything. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he sounds like he's having maybe a little allergy situation too. Um, yeah. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. This is Mr. Marion from Tobaccoville. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding, uh, I guess, a uh, committee member uh, DDM's uh, question earlier about, uh, you know, you know, being able to have money and what happens if some of these projects go up in cost. Yeah, I know we have the Meadowbrook project, you know, going up here in King. Of course, we've got the uh, Northern Beltway project going on. But in regards to the news article that came out about the default of that bridge project in North Carolina, is anything like that, you know, could that happen in, in any of our projects that we've got ongoing currently? We do not anticipate anything like that on Division Nine projects. Uh, it certainly could happen anywhere across the state, but all of our projects are in great shape. Okay. Good to hear that. Thank you. Anything else, for Mr. Ivy? Thank you, Pat. Take care of yourself. Members, are there any other reports? That, are there any other reports that you wish to have explained or would you like to just move on? And again, they are in your packet. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Mr. Chairman, this is Ella Main. I have a question, not for a report, though. Thank Did you. we lose the chair? No, the chair was here. He just is muted, so you don't hear him coughing and sneezing and gagging, and sometimes <laughs> I'm forgetting to unmute. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir, Mr. Alamein. Did we lose Mr. Alamein? <laughs> the internet is wreaking havoc. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes. Can you hear? Okay, thank you very much. I just want to bring to the attention of the problem we're having on Oak Summit Road between Germantown and Royal Hall Road. Apparently, there's another development occurring beside Summit Square 2, and that in itself is going to be eight additional homes on that very narrow road. It's really not designed to carry that many people, or automobiles specifically. And I got the report that a traffic study had been done, which we really appreciated. I'm speaking for the as a community officer now, but we found out that they've extended the development that they're doing now much further along Oak Summit than we had originally been told. So I really want to make it an urgent appeal that we do something to improve the, that road before someone is likely to lose their lives or more than one life, because it's created even more stringent demand on that narrow road for all the traffic to come on there. Uh, and again, that's between Germanton Road, or they call it Highway 8, and Old Rural Hall Road. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Alamein. Any other questions? Very good. So let's jump down to uh, some information about our next meeting. Folks, we have some a couple of decisions to make, and I, I really want to get your, your thoughts on it. Um, the, the, we are exploring the issue about continuing our virtual meetings 
and the city attorney hasn't shared with us her opinion on that yet, but we hope to have that in the next couple of weeks. But the question before this committee is, um, number one, if we have the opportunity to continue virtual, would you like to do that? Or B, would you like to go ahead and move into in-person meetings again? And this would be for our May 19 meeting. <clears throat> Mr. Chair? Yes, ma'am. Presently, the city buildings, including the one that we meet in, requires masks. Uh, until that's lifted, I think it's a moot point at this point, unless the mayor lifts that or the council but I have no problem meeting in person. Uh, we're, as a matter of fact, we went back live with the city council, but we have the plexiglass petitions in front overhead size. We built a new addition to our council chambers, uh, not just for the safety of the council, but the safety of staff. We don't allow people in the chamber uh, to congregate, they have to meet in the committee room and they come in one at a time for public comments uh, on any cases zoning when it's a public hearing is required. And there is also the same setup for them at the podium as well as the city manager, city attorney and all of those that are at the lower part of the desk uh, in the chamber now. Uh, again, I have no issue with coming back in person. Uh, if the city go, will allow us to meet without masks, uh, you know, it's whatever the majority wants to do, or we could do a hybrid to start with. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Adams. I think one of the challenges we have in our meeting room, we really don't have the opportunity to construct those partitions. And so this would require staff to find a larger meeting room where we could socially distance or spread out uh, to be able to conduct our in-person in meetings. Uh, that that does present a bit of a challenge for staff, but I'm assured by um, by them they could they could handle that. The um, the the meetings that also provide um, virtual participation and in-person in participation are really kind of a nightmare to try to pull off. They require a lot of technology and some rooms have that built in, some rooms don't have that built in. So um, I don't know, it seems to be, it, it would be our guidance maybe that if we were to, A, continue with virtual meetings until we are told we, we can't do that anymore, or B, go ahead and say we're going to go back to in-person meetings and that way we could give the staff direction on to move forward and find a place where we can meet safely. Members, any other thoughts? Uh, Mike, Mike Combest here from Clemens. Yes, sir. I, I would recommend that if possible we stay virtual it seems to me that our the quality of the decisions we're making are adequate the efficiency and saving and travel time etc cetera, etc cetera, is has been good i can't see any compelling reason to go back to physical meetings we have the technology we have the capability we have the ability to exploit it obviously and we ought to continue using it. Thank you, Mr. Combess. Any other members? Mr. Chairman, James Shores from Davidson County. I, yes, I agree with uh, my colleagues and uh, I think that with the unknown of everything else and whether the city will or won't and this and that and the other, it's just so much easier to to do it virtually. Um, we don't seem to be having a problem coming together virtually and uh, I would say continue on just like we are. Thank you, sir. Mr. Chairman, Bill Apple from Kernersville. Uh, I certainly support those who, who have uh, recommended we continue virtually. In fact, uh, I'm sitting in North Myrtle Beach as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Apple, we're getting, we're getting ready to mute you, Mr. Apple. I understand. I don't have my video on, so that's one accommodation. <laughs> but uh, it, it really does make it possible for those of us who are traveling a lot with our town and city responsibilities to still attend and not be missing in action when we meet. So I support the continuation of virtual. Thanks, sir. And Mr. Chair, can you check, as you said, with legal, even on a state level, because a lot of the virtual meeting amendments or resolutions are now being 
uh, pull. Uh, the cities and government business, they want to be back in person. So uh, I would suggest also that you check with the state to see if there would be a problem uh, with this committee continuing to meet virtually. Thank you, Ms. Adams. That's an excellent suggestion. <coughs> Mr. Members Chairman, I agree with you know, you know members of what they had just said uh, previously about meeting continue to meet virtually, and also I was happy to see that a member of the public could actually present today. Yes, virtually. sir. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, thank you. I'll I'll assume from your comments or or uh, deduce from your comments that we would, if we possible, we'd like to continue in virtual meetings. Uh -huh and um kind of irregardless of what the city or county direct on virtual um, i guess i'm guessing primarily they're going to be removing their their options for virtual we'll check with the state to see if we can't continue this in some format since we are a multi-jurisdictional uh committee very good members anything else this afternoon before we adjourn well, I thank you. Mr. Chairman, I just wanted to do one last plug for the ethics. I think most people have already filed their ethics, but if you have not, please, please, please do so by April 15th, tax day. Um, if you have not, this that is the final deadline and there are um, fines attached to any late um, filing. So if you have need any assistance um, with that, uh, please let me know. I'm glad to help. Kelly, would you do me a favor and maybe just send out a quick reminder to our members who still need to fill it out? Yes, sir. Will that do. would be, I think that'd be I really will actually helpful. start calling everybody next week. <laughs> <laughs> and that, folks, and her calls are not pleasant when she wants to. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Kelly. Members, anything else this afternoon? Um, I thank you for your indulgence on a um, on an antihistamine laden chairman who stumbled several times at this meeting today, but I appreciate your understanding of, of sometimes that happens. If there are no other issues or items to come before our committee this afternoon, we'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion, Mr. Chairman, that we adjourn. Is that Mr. Combest? As James Shores. Right. Thank you, Mr. Shore. Mr. Shore makes the motion. Is there a second, please? Mr. Marion, second. Mr. Mary makes a second. Very good. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Is there any oppose? Thank you, folks. Have a lovely spring weekend. See you in May. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.